To start things off, I'm going to speak for the next 20 minutes about how you can quantify the cost of fixing versus preventing bugs. We will start with a discussion about why organizations hesitate to adopt more bug prevention testing. Then we will present a spreadsheet where you can calculate how much fixing bugs costs your software engineering team. Finally, we will talk about various approaches to software testing and how to easily adopt an increasingly mature testing process over time. So bug fixing is very inefficient in an organization. It introduces a lot of costs that you may not think about. So when your software engineers are developing code and then they send it over for testing, they move on to the next thing that they need to work on for a new feature. Meanwhile, the integration team or the test team may find bugs in what they're looking at, what they're testing, and those get fed back to the engineer. And the engineer has to now go and context switch back to what they were looking at when they did the, the other code, the first code, um, the code that has the bug. So now they're going through a debug cycle, they're trying to figure it out, and now they make a fix and they send that back off to the integration team and they can context switch back to the new feature they're developing. And the more this goes on, the slower it is to get the new feature out because they keep getting interrupted. And it takes time to get your head back to where you were when you were working on, uh, on the new code. So it's very inefficient and very disruptive. What your engineer should be doing is focusing on these new features. As you know, software is becoming more and more prevalent. We're trying to do a lot more things with software, and it's also becoming more and more complex. And so we want our software engineers to have the time they need to focus on these new features without these interruptions. Organizations struggle to try to introduce testing earlier. Most organizations know they need to kind of shift left and move testing earlier in the life cycle, but they're afraid to do that because they're afraid they don't want to slip their releases. Um, they don't want to give more work to the engineers. They may feel like they don't have time to test or there's not enough resources to test. Um, they can't afford the schedule delays. And so part of this analysis of bug fixing versus bug prevention really shows you that you do have the time to do that testing earlier. And so what happens is your plan may be after your requirements and your design to do some coding and then do some testing. But when you're in a bug fixing mode, your coding time takes longer because of those constant interruptions of bug fixing. And so then that makes your testing time take longer because you're sending more builds to the test team. And that's when your schedule slips come in. Organizations that focus on bug prevention, yes, they're building that test time into their coding phase, but their test later, you know, downstream test time isn't taking longer. In fact, it could be taking shorter because you're continuously testing and that's how you meet your original release dates. So building time into that coding phase to do that testing, which isn't disruptive, will help you meet your schedules and keep your quality high. So there was a book published in 2012 called How Google Tests Software. And it's about um, Google's efforts to understand why they were having quality, software quality issues. And they did some analysis around that and they found that incomplete testing was one of their biggest barriers to success. And they actually went through the exercise to quantify the cost of that poor software quality in terms of the number of engineers involved in fixing bugs. 
and they put an action plan together to improve software quality through continuous testing. And they put an initiative in place to test earlier in the software life cycle. And the results they achieved were to free up engineering resources to do this earlier testing, but also get new features done to beat their competitors to market. So one of the things they did was they looked at the estimated cost to fix bugs based on when in the software development life cycle they occurred. And I think common knowledge is that it's easier to fix things with developer-led testing, unit testing, because the engineer is there, they're not context switching, um, and it's less disruptive. And the further you go in the life cycle, the more expensive that, that is to fix. And so in the end, um, Google came up with about $1,500 to fix a bug on average. And they applied that metric to an analysis they did, which is outlined in this table or spreadsheet. And so what they said was, OK, let's look at how many lines of code this software team can develop in a year. And they said, OK, 200,000 lines of code will be developed in a year. Then the, you look at the average number of bugs that get generated in 1,000 lines of code. In this example, we're using eight. But if you do a web search, you will find all kinds of data from eight to 50 uh, bugs per 1,000 lines of code. And it's going to be very variable based on the complexity of the code, probably the language of the code, and a bunch of other things. So you may want to use different numbers for that. But at eight bugs per 1,000, and you could probably safely say that that's a low guess, um, with 200,000 lines of code, you're looking at 1,600 bugs per year. Uh, with that average cost of $1,500 per bug, that's $2.4 million spent bug fixing. If you say that an average engineer costs $150,000 per year, then you just divide that into the $2.4 million, and you come up with 16 engineers that that's the time allocated to bug fixing. And with a 40-person engineering team, that's 40% of your staff who are basically full-time bug fixing, which is pretty high. And again, it's a hidden cost. So you don't think about it. You just have a bunch of engineers, and they're doing their work. But when you analyze it this way, uh, you can see that a lot of them are not spending time um, building this new, these new capabilities that you want them focused on. So if you take that 40% um, of time that you're spending on bug fixing and you shift your organization to a bug prevention organization, you're going to have a bunch of time that you already have today to apply to developer-led testing. So you'll be able to, with that time saved, be able to do more testing, more developer-led testing. You'll be able to spend some of that time developing more features so that you're more competitive. And you may be able to release earlier uh, as well, depending on your schedules. So how do you start that sh transition from a bug fixing organization to a bug prevention organization? And the key thing is that you really want to embrace a continuous software quality approach. A lot of it is around automation and test automation. There are a lot of things in developer-led testing that can be automated. Um, you can use code coverage analysis in a few ways that I'll talk about in a minute, primarily to identify untested code. And your regression testing and your repeatability is really important. It's not enough to test once. You've got to constantly test to make sure you're not breaking things as your code evolves over time. And you want to set up software quality 
KPIs and a dashboard that all the stakeholders can look at so you can see your organization's progress on this uh, software quality process initiative. We find that this stair step is very helpful um, to get started. You can't make a lot of changes at once overnight, but it helps if you start with maybe the least intrusive pieces first and then add more and more as you go, as you get some success, as you feel comfortable with it. So the starting point in this stair step is static analysis. A lot of organizations are doing static analysis already, which is great. And if you're not, we strongly recommend that you, that you do adopt that. Static analysis um, looks at your code statically and tries to identify coding errors. The nice thing about a lot of static analysis tools is that they're server side capabilities. So you don't necessarily have to have all your engineers focused on running static analysis. It can be run uh, at build and test time, and then they could get reports and feedback um, on areas to address. So it's fairly non-intrusive on your software engineers. Once you have your static analysis in place, maybe you move on to code coverage. Code coverage is another great non-intrusive capability. You can add it on the server side. It will run as you run your automated tests and let you know where you have under-tested or untested code. Once you've got that under your belt, maybe you move to unit testing, developer-led testing. You want those developers to be testing their new features and the things that they're working on so that when they send that off to the integration team, it's higher quality, they're going to get less bugs back and less context switching. In some organizations, it's going to be really important to tie those unit tests to requirements and do more of a requirements-based test. Um, which again is another way to, to, to help improve your test process maturity. A key piece is the regression testing and being able to rerun these tests. A lot of organizations will develop during the day and run all their tests overnight so that when they get in the morning, they can see the, um, the results of their testing. Once you get that under your belt, it's really helpful to move to continuous testing. So the difference between regression testing and continuous testing, um, regression testing, as I said, you can just run it overnight, run all your tests at once. Continuous testing is focused on running them continuously throughout the day. So if I'm a developer working on a new feature and I've committed that branch, I may wanna kick off testing right then and there to make sure that that is uh, fully tested before it gets into the main, uh, the main line. And then the last piece on this stair step is the change-based testing. So instead of committing a, a feature or a branch and running all the tests, which might take eight hours, change-based testing will allow you to run a subset of the tests based on the code that was changed. So instead of running all eight hours of tests, maybe there's only eight minutes of tests that need to run based on the code I've changed. So now as the engineer, I'm getting immediate feedback on the, my change. And I don't have to context switch tomorrow or at a later date. I'm, I'm seeing right away if I've broken anything with these changes I've made. So by adopting and improving your test process maturity, you're actually driving down your cost of software maintenance. And the more of these stair steps that you deploy, the lower your software maintenance costs are gonna be. So in conclusion, you really want to do these things in order to improve your software quality. You wanna test early and you wanna test often. You want to be in a bug prevention mode to reduce the context switching that the engineers go through and reduce the costs of bug fixing. You wanna use test automation tools where you can, static analysis, 
obviously is a great uh, test automation tool. Code coverage is a great test automation tool, but also your regression testing and your continuous testing and your change-based testing and your developer-led testing. There's opportunities for automation all through that whole test process maturity stair step. Um, I mentioned code coverage tools in particular. Um, a lot of organizations aren't doing that, but as I said earlier, they really are a non-invasive or intrusive um, analysis capability for your teams. You put it on the server side, you let it let your tests run with your instrumentation on, and you can get good, valuable feedback on your overall software quality. And then finally, you want to optimize your test processes. As we said, you want to establish your software quality KPIs, make sure software quality is visible to all the stakeholders, and, and slowly adopt more capabilities to increase your test process maturity. So this brings me to the end of my presentation on quantifying the cost of fixing versus pre preventing bugs. As we discussed, organizations that spend a lot of time fixing bugs struggle to improve their software quality, and they also have issues with schedule delays. I hope you'll be able to use the spreadsheet to calculate the cost of fixing bugs in your own organization. And by adopting an increasingly mature testing process over time and using the suggestions of how to get started, you can move your organization to bug prevention and meet your testing deadlines while adding more new features to your code. I look forward to your questions during the Q&A session. Thank you for listening.